king of the world! Who can't handle the truth? I feel the need. Song Church. For those of you that maybe got here a little bit late, didn't hear my introduction earlier. My name is Paul. I serve as our campus pastor here at our Sutton campus. Um, also have the privilege of coming alongside Pastor David and Janelle, serving as our executive pastor, helping lead our team here. Um, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to wrap up our Director's Cut series here today. Pastor David is actually preaching at another church, friend of ours, um, Coastal Community Church down in Florida. Don't worry, he's, it's not a job interview. He's not moving to Florida, all right? He's staying right here in New England, okay? But we love that our lead pastor and his wife um, just have a heart for the, the broader church, not just our personal expression of the local church, but the broader church. And any opportunity we get to invest in the broader church, we're grateful uh, for it. Uh, but let me go ahead and open us up in prayer today, and we'll jump into the message. Father, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to gather together as a church, Lord, to hear from you, uh, to celebrate, Lord, the life change that we just got to celebrate uh, through water baptism. And Father, we ask that you would have your hand upon uh, this message, Lord, that you would help it do in us what you want it to, and that you'd guide my words in the delivery. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. So if you're new to Life Song Church, we're in a series. This is a final week of our Director's Cut series. And it's a series in which we look at modern day movies and find the biblical truth that's woven throughout the stories that are told. And you might say, well, why do we do that? Well, if you know much about Jesus' ministry and the way that he taught, he would often connect the principles of God, God's truth, to things from modern-day society that people understood. There's just something powerful when we can take the truth of God's word and connect it to something that we all can relate to. And there's, there's power in storytelling, right? There's power in movies. There's things that we relate to in movies. And sometimes when we see how much they can connect to the truth that God is trying to help us understand, it makes it come alive so much more in our life. And so the first week of Director's Cut, we looked at Jurassic World Dominion, one of my boys' favorite movies. Um, and then week two, we looked at Sing 2. Last week was Top Gun Maverick, one of my favorite movies. And this week, we're looking at Spider-Man No Way Home. How many of you have seen Spider-Man No Way Home? All right. So Spider-Man No Way Home, don't want to spoil it for you. You're going to get a little bit of spoiler today if you haven't seen it. So shame on you for not keeping up with our movies for Director's Cut. All right. But there's three Spider-Mans in it. All right. It's kind of one of the fun things about this Spider-Man movie. They bring back some of the... The older Spider-Man. So who in here, your favorite Spider-Man, the Spider-Man's made in the last two decades, is Tobey Maguire. Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Okay, so we got some Tobey Maguire fans. How many liked Andrew Garfield? All right, we got some. How many like Tom Holland the best? All right, I'm, I'm with you guys. I like Tom Holland the best. Thought they all did a great job in their own right. Tom Holland fan. All right, so to just kind of set the stage for what we're stepping into, because this is really the third part in this Spider-Man trilogy, the current iteration of Spider-Man. And so coming out of the last movie, at the end of the last movie, there's a villain named Mysterio who's really masquerading as, a, as this false hero. So Spider-Man defeats him at the end. He ends up actually getting killed by a misfire or, or the firing that, that he had commenced of these drones he was using. And he released this video right before he died that revealed that Spider-Man was Peter Parker. And it also made it look like Spider-Man was the one that had killed him. So this, new, this, this movie that we're looking at today picks up where that movie left off. And it's kind of confusing. They all, all the movies have home in them. All right, the first one is Spider-Man Homecoming, then Spider-Man Far From Home. Today, Spider-Man No Way Home. All right, so that was the end of Spider-Man Far From Home. We pick up Spider-Man No Way Home, and it shows the aftermath of everyone now knowing that Peter Parker is Spider-Man and now thinking that he's really more of a villain because he killed this guy that they all thought was a good guy, Mysterio, okay? He really wasn't. And so what happens is you start to see the impact this is having on his family and his friends, all right? They get taken into custody, they're interrogated, they're harassed in public. He and his friends aren't allowed to get into college. They're, they're denied college admission. And so 
in the wake of all of this, Peter Parker is trying to figure out how do I fix this now that everyone knows that Spider Man is just, it's not a good, or knows that I'm Spider Man, Peter Parker, it's just not a good thing and it's negatively affecting my friends and my family. So he goes to Doctor Strange, who's this, if you don't know Doctor Strange, he's strange. It's a great name for him, but he's this wizard, right? So he can do all kinds of crazy things. He says, Doctor Strange, can you help me? And so he finally gets Doctor Strange to agree to cast this spell to make it possible for everyone who now knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man to no longer know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. But as he starts to cast the spell, Peter Parker realizes, wait a second, there's two or three people that I'd like to not forget that I'm Spider-Man. Like my girlfriend. It was kind of cool when she learned that I was Spider-Man. My best friend, I want him to still know. And so Doctor Strange is trying to change the spell mid-cast, and as he does, it gets out of control and gets corrupted, and he tries to contain it. And at first he thinks he does. But then we discover that he didn't. And this corrupted spell starts to pull in folks from other universes. We're now in the multiverse, everyone. All right? It's a thing. It's a thing. Marvel is milking the multiverse thing. All right? So in the multiverse, it starts to pull in these villains from parallel universes who know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. They start to wreak havoc on Peter Parker's world. And so Doctor Strange starts to capture these villains that have made their way from these parallel universes into their universe and puts them in these, this underground bunker that he's got. And we're going to pick up the story as these villains are in this underground bunker. And they start to discover that in the universes they come from, they actually died. All right? So Doctor Strange is capturing all these guys, trying to figure out a way to send them home to their universes. And these guys are realizing, wait a second, if I go back to this parallel universe, to my universe, my home, my, my fate is to die. And so that's where we pick up in this first clip. So in this scene, we see Doctor Strange and Peter Parker fighting over this idea of these guys' fate and whether or not that can be changed. And in uh, Romans 5.12, it talks a little bit about the fate that we all, as individuals, as humans, are predispositioned for from the point of birth. So I want to invite you to turn over your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, When Adam sinned, Sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone's sin. Romans 6.23 reveals that the wages of sin is death. So every one of us is born with this predisposition towards sin and death. That is the fate that we are on track for. It's a pretty sobering thought, right? You're like, great, I'm so glad I came to church to get encouraged today, right? And so like Dr. Strange says there, right? This is who we are. He says you can't change that any more than you can change who they are. And, and oftentimes we can look at the world around us and just be like, yep, they're, they're on track to hell. Right? Well, the reality is we all were on track to hell. That's how we all started. Right? Because of what Adam did. He allowed sin and death into this world. God didn't create the world that way. He didn't create us with that as our predisposed destination. But Adam disobeyed God. He obeyed the enemy, and as a result of that, he ended up turning over the authority that God had given to him. He gave it to the enemy. And as a result, sin and death came into the world and corrupted what God had originally created as so beautiful and so perfect. And as a result, everyone that's been born since Adam has been born with this bent towards sin and ultimately the penalty for sin, which is death. But as Peter Parker challenges the fate of these guys, like maybe it doesn't have to end that way. The Bible does give us some hope, all right? There is some encouragement here today, I promise you, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22 says this. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. So as we got to celebrate here this morning through water baptism, through Jesus, we've been raised to new life. All right? Our fate doesn't have to be 
death and eternal separation from God. We can be raised to new life. We can experience an eternity with Him. We can have His Spirit living in us, helping us overcome that bent towards sin that we're all born with, that sin nature. But what is it that turns the tide, right? What is it that makes the kind of stories that we celebrated this morning possible? Well, Paul has a little more to say about that in Romans. In Romans 10, 13 through 14, he says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So it talks about the fact that those who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. Their fate can be changed. But how is it changed? Because someone tells them. Because they hear the good news of Jesus. So the big idea for today's message is this. The fate of those around us depends on us. God has placed you in the lives of others. He's given you influence to be able to change their fate. All right, we're going to pick up the story here right where we left off. I mean, I think that mirror dimension would be a really cool ride at like Disney World or Six Flags. How many of you would like, I would stay a million miles away from that ride, right? Kind of trippy. How many of you ever tried to help somebody and it got messy? got complicated. So you heard there at the end, the lizard, right? He's got a really complicated villain name. Just call, just call him the lizard. Call him exactly what he looks like, right? But he says, when you try to fix people, there are always consequences, right? And many of us, I think, can relate to trying to help people, and it just it getting messy, right? Jesus wasn't afraid of the mess, though, right? Jesus hung out with the folks that were rejected by the religious leaders of his day. And he didn't stop just because he was criticized for it. All right, Jesus embraced Judas as one of his closest followers, even though Judas would one day betray him. He spent time with a Samaritan, teaching her about the things of God, even though the Jewish people of his day wanted nothing to do with Samaritans. Spent time teaching and healing those that would one day shout for his crucifixion. See, messiness comes with helping messy people. Wouldn't it be great if everyone we tried to share Jesus with just embraced that? Like, oh, you want to help me? Oh, I'm, I'm on a, a path of sin and death and eternal separation from God. You want to help steer me clear of that? Yes, sign me up. How many of you have ever had those encounters? Right? Nobody. Exactly. Right? Why? Because it takes time. It takes time to break down walls, to work through tensions, to gain trust, and to ultimately find a way to somebody's heart. And it can get messy, and it can be complicated along the way. In Peter's case, the villains he was trying to help, they really struggled with the idea of giving up the power that they'd come to experience and like. And so even though they knew their fate was to go back and die, if they hung on to that power and kept things the way that they were, they struggled to give up that power. How does that make any sense? It doesn't, but it, it's real. Yeah. And the truth is that for us, those that we're trying to reach, as much as they need what we're endeavoring to Bring to them the salvation that Jesus offers. Just like these villains who struggled to receive the salvation Peter was trying to make available to them, they struggle with it, right? People can know the path they're on, the habits that they have in place aren't good for them, and yet they can still struggle to give up those habits. Why? Well, see, we're all born with this sinful nature. It's got a bent towards the wrong things. And the Bible has some things to say about that. In 1 John 2, 16 through 17, it says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. 
And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. So it's acknowledging these are the things that people crave for, right? Physical pleasure. We crave some physical pleasure, right? We crave accomplishment. We crave possessions, right? We're constantly seeing what others have and we're wanting those things. We crave those things. Ephesians 2, 2 through 3, Paul talks more about it. He says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. And so the sinful nature that we have, the sinful nature that those we're trying to reach with the gospel of Jesus have, makes it hard, makes it complicated, makes it messy when we try to open their hearts and their minds to the good news of Jesus. Because even though they may know, yep, the path I'm on, I see where it's leading me and it's not good, but I'm, I, I've got this sin nature. I've got th- these passions and these desires that I just, I don't know that I want to give up. That what you're offering over here, it's unfamiliar to me. And so they push back. And sometimes in all that pushback and all the struggle, we can wonder, is it really even worth it, right? Maybe we end up in a place like Dr. Strange, It's their fate. I can't change it. And Peter, in his struggle to help these guys, you know, at first he was able to help one of them. He was able to help Doc Ock. But then the others started to push back. They didn't want to give up the power they had. And he ended up in quite a battle that we're going to pick up in the middle of. All right, so we see where Peter kind of hit that point where he's just like, you know, this wasn't worth it. I should have just let them go home to die. And I think oftentimes we can end up in a place where we're discouraged. You've been trying to reach that neighbor, that coworker, that family member. Like, I've been praying for 17 years, trying to share the gospel, trying to demonstrate God's love to them. And they're just so closed off. Maybe you've been criticized. Maybe you've been rejected in your efforts to help people, to steer them off of the path that they're on, the fate they're headed towards. And you just kind of hit a point where like, I, maybe it's not even worth it. Maybe I just, I'm, I'm never going to be able to help change them, help them receive the salvation that Jesus offers them. I think... As Christians, sometimes we can almost slip into a consumeristic approach to our faith. I think this this actually got exacerbated during our COVID journey, right? We all got comfortable engaging church, engaging our relationship with God from the comfort of our bedroom, our living room sofa, right? Yeah, we turn on good teaching. We listen to worship music. We'd open our Bible, and we felt like we were tight with God. Things are amazing, right? And for a stretch there, like, that's all we had, right? There, there were realities in the pandemic where we had to do things virtually. But I think some of us stayed in that a little too long. Some maybe are still in it, where we feel like, yep, as long as me and God are good, I'm, I'm, I'm doing things to connect with Him personally, That's all there is, right? Maybe we come and go from church, we take in the message, and nobody really knows who we are. We don't take any steps to get connected. And it has become all about us, right? Our relationship with God is just about me and him. But similar to what Aunt May says there to Peter, we've been given a gift. What Jesus has done for us The salvation that has been extended to us and that we've received, that is a gift. And with that gift comes some responsibility. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. 
So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So next thing I want you to write down is this. Those who receive the gospel are entrusted with sharing the gospel. The gift that we've received, it's described right there, right? It's described as a gift. We now have a responsibility to go share it with others. Not because it's necessarily going to be easy, but it's what we've been entrusted with. You know, we see earlier in the movie, after Doc Ock is freed from this chip that's got this mental hold on him. He's freed. He's no longer on the path he was on. He turns to Peter and he says, how can I help? And that should be our posture, right? When we receive Jesus, we see what he does in our lives. We, could, we should look to others and feel a sense of responsibility. How can I help them? How can I help them experience what I've experienced? We're God's game plan. We're his plan to reach the world. And if we make our relationship with God all about just me and him in a silo, me and him on my bed, me and him on my sofa, we're not stewarding the responsibility that God has entrusted to us to be his ambassadors. So what did we read earlier? If people don't hear, how are they going to believe? How's their fate ever going to change if no one tells them? So if you don't tell those God has given you influence with, who's going to tell them? You're God's game plan. And Jesus said it'd be hard. Matthew 5, 11 through 12, he says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. Think about it. If you're in that moment, be like, did, did he mean to say that? Is he serious right now? What is there to be glad about? It says, for great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You know, we can find encouragement in seeing those that we read about in the Bible that followed God, that told people about him, that tried to turn people's hearts to him, that, that were persecuted, that got rejected. It's like, okay, it's not a new story. When I get criticized and rejected, it happened to those that came before me. In fact, Jesus talks about how it happened to him. In John 15, 18 through 20, he says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. So you're in good company when you're criticized for trying to tell people about Jesus. Again, they've got that sin nature. They've got things in them that are pulling them away from it. There's going to be resistance. And Jesus said, listen, it happened to me. Don't be surprised when it happens to you. But just because we know it's coming doesn't mean it's, it's easy. I'm going to pick up this story with Peter Parker as he's wrestling through the challenge of, of what he's just walked through. If you don't know what happened in the movie after what we just watched, his aunt actually passed. She died from the injuries that she suffered. And we're, we're, we're going to rejoin him here where he's, he's processing all that and he's just sitting in the, the discouragement of, I, I tried to help these folks. And it's had devastating effects in my life. Let's check it out. Notice in that scene how he's, he starts off in this place of being all alone and discouraged. Just felt like it, none of it was worth it. And in his first response to Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man is, don't try to tell me you, you know what I'm going through. What I want you to write down is this. If the enemy can keep us isolated, he can keep us discouraged. When the enemy can make us feel like no one knows what we're facing, no one knows how hard it's been to share Jesus with this family member, try to help pull them out of the sewage that they're in, or this coworker, this neighbor, and you got the battle scars to prove it, he can keep us discouraged. And that principle applies in so many areas of our life. 
The enemy loves to battle us in our mind and make us feel all alone, feel like we're the only ones who have ever done this, ever felt this way, ever gone through this thing. But notice in the scene we just saw, how as the different Peter Parkers start sharing their stories, Tom Holland's character realizes, wow, that they can relate to me. They have gone through similar things. They have suffered loss. They have faced challenges like the challenges I'm going through. And you could see the light starts to come back in his eyes. There's a hope that starts to return. And that's why it's so important for us to not stay isolated, right? The consumeristic approach to our relationship with God actually isolates us. Because we don't invite others into that journey. It's all about us and God. There's nobody else in the room. That's a dangerous place to be. But as the old African proverb says, if you want to run fast, run alone. If you want to run far, run together. There's a reason Jesus sent his disciples out in pairs to go do ministry because we need others alongside us that will pick us up, that will encourage us, that will share their experiences. Let us know we're not alone. That will join us in faith and help pray for that loved one we've been trying to reach. We'll pray that God gives us wisdom, gives us discernment, gives us the words we need at the right time. That God will bring others into that person's life who they'll be receptive to. That God will move on their hearts and open their hearts to him. We need others in the journey. And that's what the local church is all about. The local church is all about this mission that we've been talking about today. And it, it's really, there's two parts to this. As we lock arms in community with one another for the mission of helping reach our community for Jesus, We're doing what Paul says needs to happen in Romans, right? We're sharing the good news of Jesus with those who don't yet know him. We're making it possible for their fate to be changed, for them to receive Jesus as their savior. And so you're taking up your responsibility to do that as you receive this gift. You're not turning around and making it possible for others to receive that gift. But the second thing that happens as we lock arms with one another is we're there to help hold each other up. We're there to help encourage each other when we stumble. Or when we're just discouraged, we don't think it's worth going on. And so I just I want to ask you today, in what ways do you need to stop staying isolated in your engagement of your faith? And do you need to start getting some other people alongside you in the journey? Your faith is not just about you and God. Now that you've received that gift, he's entrusting you to steward that gift well to be his ambassador to the world around you. There's a reason we talk about community so much around here. There's a reason we encourage you to go attend next steps. Learn how you can get connected here. Learn how you can jump in and play a part. How you can take up your responsibility as a believer to be an ambassador and carrying forth the mission of the church to the community that we're called to reach with the good news of Jesus. So today, you may have people in your life that you would say, you know what? I haven't been stewarding my responsibility well with them. Maybe God's been tugging on your heart to share with that neighbor, that coworker. And you know what? It doesn't always start with seeing that person at the water cooler and being like, hey, let me open up John 3.16. Let's talk about Jesus today, right? It often doesn't start that way. It starts relationally. It starts by seizing opportunities to share about the impact God's had in your life, to share in your story. And you'd be surprised over time how God will open up doors for conversation, how God will move on people's hearts. But you have to be willing to have the conversations. You've got to be willing to establish relationship and to go there as God guides you in the dialogue. And so maybe you've got some folks that you feel God's stirring on you. All right, I need to start being more intentional in that relationship. Okay, maybe, maybe today you need to take a step to get off the sidelines, 
Register for next steps. Pull up that church center app. Text Deliver Hope to 97,000 because you're ready to jump in and play a part. Join the team. Maybe you're in a place where the enemy's allowed you to be discouraged because he's kept you isolated. And you need to start getting some others around you in the journey. Again, same place. Register for next steps. That's where we talk about it. That's where we talk about how you can get connected, how you can get others alongside you in the pursuit of Jesus and in the carrying out of the mission he's entrusted to us. Let me pray for us here this morning. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the incredible sacrifice that he made to make it possible for our fate to be changed. We were born on track for a life bound by sin, destined for eternal separation from you. But we thank you, Jesus, for making it possible for your spirit to break the power of sin in our life. As you paid the price for our sin, to pave a way for us to spend eternity with you. And now that we've received that gift, we want to be responsible stewards of that gift. We want to be those who will tell others about you, those who may not ever hear about you if we don't tell them. And so I ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom. You would open doors in conversation. You would give us influence with the right people in the right ways so that we can be your ambassadors. We can turn the hearts of those in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our families to you. And Lord, I ask that you bring the right people around us in the journey. People that you want to be there to help lift us up and that you want us to be there for to help lift them up in those times of discouragement, those times where we need others to just join their faith with us. And Lord, we pray that you would be glorified through our efforts as we make our faith not just about us and you, but about all those around us whose fates you desire to change. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Now I want to take a moment here for those of you in here who maybe you would say, you know what? I haven't received what Jesus did for me. See, Jesus came, he lived a sinless life, and then he paid the price for our sin. He became our substitute. And that's why it's possible for us to not have to pay that price ourselves. But we have a part to play. It's an easy part, people. It's an easy part. Our part is to receive Jesus as our substitute, to receive his gift of salvation. If we don't receive it, we're left in a place of having to pay the price for our sin ourselves. God doesn't want that, but that's the place that we end up in if we reject him, if we reject the salvation he extends to us. So if you're here today and you would say, I'm ready to receive Jesus as my substitute, receive the salvation, that gift that he offers to me, I'm going to ask you here in a moment with every head bowed, every eye closed, to just slip up your hand to indicate to God and to me that you're ready to take that step. And then we're going to collectively pray a prayer together to declare our faith in Jesus. Paul talks about that being part of our, th- that step of receiving Jesus as our Savior. We believe it in our heart and we declare it with our mouth. And so we're going to collectively pray that prayer to declare with our mouth our faith in Jesus. So if that's you, on the count of three, I want to ask you to slip up your hand and indicate to me and to God you're ready to take that step and then we'll pray together, all right? One two, three. Who's ready to take that step to receive Jesus as your Savior here today, to receive the gift he offers you, to change the fate, the destination that you're currently headed towards? All right. Well, with everyone in here, I want to invite you to repeat these words after me. Father God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you sent him to pay the price for my sin. And I thank you that you raised him back to life so that I can have new life through him. Today, Jesus, I declare that you are my Lord and you are my Savior. I submit my life to you from this point forward. It's in your mighty name I pray. Amen. 
Well, can we celebrate everyone who just took that step? You can stand to your feet. Prayer team, you're welcome to come down front at this time.